Okay, well, let's get started. It's uh, two minutes past one. Everyone, welcome very much to this uh, practical and informative joint webinar of the Houston chapter of the NAF, which stands for the Netherlands America Foundation and the NBSO Texas. Uh, we're very proud to have some very knowledgeable and informed speakers. Uh, before starting the webinar, um, some minor Zoom technical practicalities for this webinar. The chat uh, is used for general remarks. The Q&A is used for questions. And at the end of the net webinar, we'll answer uh, the questions live. There are already quite a number of questions that have come in. Uh, so don't hesitate to add to those and uh, we'll see if we can get through all of them. This webinar is organized for NAF members and is open for all that have an interest or an affinity for the American, Dutch, or say Netherlands heritage and relationship. Thank you Maria, Kuhn and Saskia for putting the event together and to Jacqueline, Laura and Lieske for getting the word out. We're in a very fluid and uncertain times. A pandemic like this and how the various governments and organizations respond to it is unprecedented. With no guidance from past experience, either individually or collectively by the governments, uh, we are left with adapting to the situation as it unfolds. We have three knowledgeable speakers who will take us into the world of travel during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we're opening up and easing uh, the restrictions, what that means, the speakers are Ruth Emmerich, Consul General at the Consulate General of the Kingdom in the of the Netherlands in Miami. Uh, Marke Hudson, Consul at Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer and Felt. And Diederik Scheepstra, Commercial Director, USA KLM. We're going to start with a poll. Um, trying to find out what all your travel plans are for the next three months. Uh, Maria, can you initiate the poll? So what are the results, uh, Maria? So we can see a lot of people, 76%, yeah, they have plans to travel in the next month. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, yeah, if I add the not sure and uh, yes, Almost everybody has travel plans, uh, with only a few saying, no, I'm staying home. Okay, thank you. Uh, that gives a little bit of context for all of us. And uh, uh, yeah, it should be interesting. Uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth Emery, Consul General of the Consulate General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and Miami. Ruth will share with us the operational aspects uh, of the Dutch government response to the COVID-19 pandemic as it relates to travel to and from the Netherlands, mostly from the US. Ruth, the floor is yours. Next. Thank you uh, very much, Naf and NBSO for inviting me. I can imagine that there are many questions regarding consular services and indeed also the, don't, the do's and don'ts uh, of traveling during COVID-19. So I hope that Maka, Diederik and I will be able to answer most of your questions with our presentations. So the first topic that I would like to address is the uh, reopening of the consulate, or in other words, what about the, Dutch con the, the consular services to Dutch citizens? So because of the, of the coronavirus, we had to suspend our regular consular services mid-March. And consular service was then only provided in cases of humanitarian or medical urgencies. Since then, the regular consular services have not been resumed, but services have been extended compared to the first two months of the suspension. 
that we now provide limited consular services with regard to visas, Dutch travel documents and naturalizations. We do not yet issue consular statements, nor do we legalize documents. And this has to do with restrictions in the local and Dutch context, such as the travel bans in place and limited staff presence in buildings as a consequence of hygiene and protection measures. The exception to the suspension of consular services are made in consultation with the agencies in the Netherlands that will need to process the applications submitted at diplomatic missions abroad. So what does the current extended exception policy means? The consulate can issue Schengen visas to a number of exception categories, such as family members of Dutch citizens, uh, for citizens of the European Union, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland living in the Netherlands, their family members who wish to travel to the Netherlands. But also other persons who have a convincing or compelling reason to visit their family in the Netherlands, such as attending childbirth or in relation to serious or ter terminal illness. And persons working in the transport of, transport of goods, including lorry drivers and seafarers. We normally also issue Caribbean visa. However, it's not yet possible to restart partially the, uh, the Caribbean visa process. There are far reaching local measures in place in the various Caribbean kingdom countries, including entry bans. So for the time being, the extended exception policy for Schengen visa does not apply for Caribbean visa. We can issue temporary residence permits, the so-called MVV visa, to members of, a Dutch ho members of a Dutch host, family members of a Dutch host, also in urgent or necessary cases at the request of the Dutch Immigration and Naturalization Service, and to persons um, in possession of an MVV visa who, because of COVID-19, could not travel within the period of validity of the MVV. An MVV issuance to persons with, whose appointments were cancelled due to COVID-19 can also be resumed. However, it's important to note that uh, persons in possession of this MVV visa are exempt from the entry ban for the Netherlands, but they may not be able to transit through other countries, both Schengen and non-Schengen, due to national restrictions. So it's important to check that in advance. And Dutch travel documents, uh, such as passports and, in, and emergency travel documents, they can currently be issued to Dutch travelers abroad. So they, the Dutch travelers, were called upon uh, by the government to return already in the initial phase of the COVID-19 crisis, if possible. So as far as possible, we also provide valid travel document if needed to facilitate this. Dutch citizens who live abroad and who are in a country other than the one in which they reside and wish to return to the Netherlands or to the country in which they reside. If they are still able to do so through commercial opportunities and need a travel document for this, we facilitate this as much as possible. But also Dutch citizens who live abroad and who want to stay there, but who need an ID uh, to extend their resident status, to identify themselves, or for professional reasons. Again, for example, lorry drivers. So this category is facilitated if applying for a Dutch uh, travel document is the only option, and not, for example, if the person still has a foreign uh, identity document. Lastly, also naturalization tests and alternative naturalizations, so digital ceremony or through email, that's, that's possible as well. But I would like to stress, please keep an eye on our website for up-to-date information about consular services. We will post any further extensions to the current exception categories or upcoming changes there. What I say today may no longer be uh, the latest in July. So feel free to double check with the consulate when something isn't clear, both in the Netherlands and in the US, we continue to work on expanding the consular services, where and as soon as possible. So the second topic I'd like to address is repatriation, or a question we received uh, regularly, how to get home. At each point uh, so far during the pandemic, the Netherlands has had its borders open for Dutch nationals. And from the US, it has always been possible to fly to the Netherlands commercially. So therefore, there have not been any government, government assistance or uh, repatriation flights from the US to the Netherlands. And even though KLM and some other carriers suspended direct services to the Netherlands from Houston or from Miami, where the consulate is based, it has remained possible to book a direct flight from Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, LA, New York, and also direct flights to Europe with a connecting flight to the Netherlands continued to be available. 
the Dutch government did reach out to Dutch citizens who, um, with, a, with a new registration tool for travelers who needed special assistance. This came on top of the regular registration service for purposes of staying informed uh, about updates in travel advisories to be able to be reached in case of emergency, etc. Despite the fact that flights continue to be available, the consulate has answered many phone calls and emails from Dutch citizens regarding traveling home or their, uh, in sometimes very unfortunate situations, um, no other choice than, than have an extended stay in the US. We also provided assistance to a special category of travelers, and those are the passengers and crew on board of cruise ships. And that is because these cruise related travelers had been confronted with restrictions various governments put in place and they were no longer allowed to make use of commercial flights. So the consulate has called upon and supported the cruise companies to uh, in finding ways to repatriate the guests and crew members. And actually KLM's played an important role there as well. Uh, the third topic I'd like to address is traveling to the Netherlands. Um, Mid-March, the conditions for entry to the Netherlands have been tightened. The travel ban has recently been extended to June 30th. The travel ban in place is a restriction on all non-essential travel of persons from third countries to Europe, all EU member states, all Schengen members and the UK. And that is obviously in order to prevent the spread of, of the COVID-19 virus. The travel restriction, however, does not apply to a number of exception categories and one being EU citizens, including UK nationals and members of their families. Also nationals of Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, Liechtenstein and their family members or third country nationals holding a residence card or a residence permit, holders of long stay visa and persons with an essential function or need, including personnel working in healthcare, border workers, persons employed in the transportation of goods, persons who have compelling reasons to visit their families or transit passengers. This temporary travel restriction applies in principle until the 30th of June. And what will happen afterwards? Well, a gradual reopening of the external borders on the basis of a list of third countries, determined on the basis of objective criteria. Um, and for those countries, the travel restrictions may be lifted as from the 1st of July. Honestly, I do not expect major changes for travelers from the US after the 1st of July. An important indicator for reopening the European and Dutch borders for travelers from a certain country is the extent to which the pandemic is under control compared to Europe. However, if you fall under any of the exception categories that I mentioned, you can travel to the Netherlands, even from high risk areas, including the US as determined by the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. So which measures have then been taken with regard to travelers coming from high risk areas? Uh, incoming passengers need a mandatory health declaration, which will be provided by the airline. They're strongly advised to self quarantine for 14 days upon arrival. And they should know that a travel ban applies for all non-essential travel. These measures, in addition um, to measures on airports and in airplanes, have been taken by the Dutch government to restrict the arrival of potentially COVID-19 infected travelers, as well as, of course, to protect the travelers and crew during the flight. And Maka, our second speaker, will talk about the travel ban to the US. But I just want to say here that when you do travel to the Netherlands from the US, you should know that Dutch citizens and the other exception categories, they may travel to the Netherlands, but it depends on your legal status in the US, whether you are allowed to return to the US. So my last topic briefly is the, the travel advisory of the Dutch government. Until the 15th of June, the global travel, travel advisory was do not travel if not necessary. And since then, the government updated the travel advisories for many countries in the EU and the Schengen area from orange to yellow. So what do these codes mean? Normally, green means no particular safety risks other than those that, that, um, that are comparable to what you see in the Netherlands. Yellow means be careful, there are safety risks that are different from what you use in the Netherlands. Be prepared and stay alert. Orange means travel, um, essential travel only, basically. Serious safety risks may lead to dangerous situations and travel 
for holidays is considered non-essential. If you decide to travel after all, because this is just an advisory, be prepared and stay extra alert. And red means do not travel, because there are very, safe, very serious safety risks uh, that may lead to a life-threatening situation. In the corona context, yellow means that corona measures have a certain but limited impact on daily life. Orange means that daily life is disrupted by the measures uh, to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. And countries may have banned travel to that particular country. And red means that a country um, is closed without any possibilities to enter or leave. So it's possible to go, to, uh, to go on holidays within Europe this summer. However, nothing has changed for non-European countries. Dutch citizens are still advised to reconsider the urgency of traveling to other countries. And when the color code is orange, that means that the Dutch government advises business and other travelers to reconsider the urgency of a business or family visit. The travel advice does not apply again to people who work in the transport of goods and other professional transportation services. This is considered essential travel. So while you can see on the next slide, the websites and, and contact details of the consulate, uh, I would like to stress once again that the policy is changing and it will continue to be updated according to the developments in the Netherlands as well as locally. And also, um, I'm of course happy to answer any questions after the presentations. However, if you have questions about your specific situation, you may want to contact, contact us separately so we can look into the details. So also happy to assist after this session. Thanks. Ruth, uh, thank you very much for your interesting and informative presentation. Um, I am sure at the end of the webinar, there will be plenty of questions uh, for you. Uh, Maka, Maka will address some of the leg legalities and the developments on the US side of travel from abroad. Uh, Maka, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sure. Um, as you mentioned, the pandemic has really turned the world upside down and we have never seen the level of restrictions on worldwide travel that we see now. Part of the restrictions, of course, are due to health concerns, but other parts are due to government action. Um, the U.S. government has restricted travel to the United States and it has restric restricted visa issuance um, at U.S. embassies and consulates abroad. First, if we move to the next slide, um, I'll talk about the, um, visa, the travel restriction that I'm sure um, most of our participants, most of our uh, listeners are aware of. And these are travel restrictions uh, on individuals from Schengen countries. Um, if you have been present in one of the Schengen countries for the last 14, in the last 14 days, um, you're still not allowed to come to the United States. Um, there are certain exceptions, but generally, um, independent of the uh, purpose of your visit, whether it is to come back to work uh, or to perform any other essential uh, work for your employer, you're still not allowed to come to the United States. The um, restriction was put in place on March 11th and it is still in place. Um, despite the fact that the health situation in Europe has improved greatly um, and in the United States, worse than the but still we have the travel ban on the Schengen countries despite uh, this change. Um, we, um, the, the exceptions, of course, include um, US citizens who are coming back from Europe, um, their immediate families, spouses, children, and parents, um, members of the military. Um, if you're traveling specifically to work on COVID-19 research, uh, particularly at the invitation of the US government, and a catch-all provision, um, if you're traveling, in, uh, if you're if entering the United States by a foreign national from a Schengen country, would be in the national interest of the United States. Um, we have been successful getting employees of uh, U.S. companies from Europe um, under this provision if we can show that they are performing some really essential um, service that does provide um, um, work that is in the national interest of the United States. For example, cancer research, even if it's not uh, directly related to COVID-19. Um, the US Canadian and US Mexican borders have also been closed uh, for the last two months. Um, and the closure has just been extended until the middle of July. 
So if you're a foreign national in the US and you go to Canada or to Mexico, you may not be able to come back. However, um, it is closed for non-essential travel and work in the United States is considered to be essential. So visiting family or vacation would not get you into the United States, but coming back to resume employment would. Um, that is a more um, sort of forgiving standard than the Schengen uh, countries ban. Their coming back to work, unfortunately, does not allow you to come in without having to establish that your work is in the national interest of the United States. In the US, we have not had a federally mandated uh, quarantine or uh, any restrictions on state to state travel. However, individual states have imposed requirements on um, visitors from out of state. Uh, when they enter, enter that particular state, they may need to self quarantine. We've seen that in multiple states. Those restrictions are changing uh, because the situation is changing. So it's very important to research the restrictions of the particular state if you're going to be traveling to it. For example, um, well, the primary um, um, hotspot of the pandemic early on was in New York, um, and many states restricted travel from New York or imposed self-quarantine on travelers from New York. Well, New York is doing much, much better, so now the governor of New York is considering imposing self-quarantine requirements for, traveling, uh, for travelers from out of state, those who come into New York. Um, other states that have imposed uh, self-quarantine requirements are Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, California, so large states. Um, and those requirements are all very, very specific. Um, so before traveling to particular states, it's important to research that and see if you're going to be able to do what you plan to do um, in that state or if you're first going to have to self-quarantine at home for 14 days. As Ruth mentioned, um, consulates and embassies are um, operating uh, sort of on a, on a much reduced scale. That is true for U.S. embassies and, and consulates abroad as well. Um, so the U.S. embassy in the Netherlands has been closed for everything other than emergency situations. They still provide support for U.S. citizens who need emergency support, and they do I issue emergency visas. Um, for situations that can't wait, but that's a very, very high bar um, to meet. So in general, um, U.S. embassies abroad are not issuing visas and are not open um, for consular services to um, individuals outside of those emergency situations. We have not seen any indication that the embassies are reopening right away, even though we have seen appointments being made for um, the second half of July and August. So our hope is that U.S. embassies in Europe will begin to reopen um, in the second half of July, and potentially even earlier. Uh, we also had a situation when um, uh, borders closed and flights um, were scaled down and ESTA visitors in the United States were only allowed to uh, stay for 90 days were sort of stuck in the country. Customs and Border Protection developed a um, fairly uniform system of extending ESTA authorization, extending uh, visa waiver authorization in the United States beyond 90 days. I think there are fewer and fewer people who need that extension, but in case you're in that situation and you are in the U.S. on ESTA um, and it is running out, um, it's important to contact Immigration Council or Customs and Border Protection directly um, and um, uh, process an extension for an additional 30 days. On the next slide, uh, we outline some more restrictions that have been enacted and have a preview for you of what's coming most likely later today. On April 22nd, uh, the president issued a proclamation restricting entry to the United States for new uh, green card holders. Um, they, that primarily affected um, family-based petitions, not employment-based, because most people who get a green card through employment are already in the United States on a temporary work visa. This primarily affected people who are getting the green card from abroad, and they are um, sponsored by their family members, sometimes employers. That proclamation was only extended for 60 days, and it should expire today. However, it has been widely reported that the proclamation is likely to be extended and expanded. 
And on the next slide, I want to quickly outline what has been reported, what most likely is coming down the pike later today. Today is June 22nd, the expiration of the proclamation. And so the president is expected to sign a proclamation. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, that will um, restrict entry from abroad for new holders of H-1B, L-1, um, H-2B, and J-1 visas. Most likely, those are going to be the four visas affected. Um, this was part of the original April 22nd proclamation to um, restrict um, to to analyze uh, whether restrictions on non-immigrants are needed. And the administration seems to have determined that they are needed due to the economic situation and unemployment uh, caused by COVID. So most likely for 120 days, potentially up to 180 days, we have not seen the text of the proclamation yet. New H-1B visa holders, so work visas, L-1 intercompany transferees, people working for multinational companies usually, H-2Bs who are seasonal workers, and J-1s, who include summer work travel um, employees or camp counselors, uh, would not be able to come to the United States. The proclamation is unlikely to affect anyone who's already in the U.S. It is also unlikely to affect anyone who already has a visa. And so since embassies and consulates are closed, um, so the proclamation sort of doesn't change the situation immediately because nobody can get a visa through regular processing anyway at a U.S. embassy or consulate. But as consulates and embassies begin to reopen and begin to issue visas, that proclamation is going to um, really change things. For example, um, H-1B visas began on October 1st. Um, so if you work for a U.S. company that has sponsored an H-1B employee from abroad, that employee most likely won't be able to come in on that day of October 1st. That start will be delayed. So this is coming down most likely today from the White House. Um, if they want to utilize the April 22nd proclamation, they have to expand it and extend it today, otherwise it expires. Uh, and that's why there's been so much reporting that most likely we will see a restriction on non-immigrant visas um, coming most likely today for a period of you know, somewhere between 90 and 180 days but most sources indicate it will probably be approximately 120 days. I know this will um, sort of cause a lot of questions, so I'm happy to address any in the Q&A at the end, um, and then my information, my contact information will also be available to the attendees. Thank you. Back to you shortly. So now again, thank you, Maka. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting to learn uh, about these legal implications and uh, uh, yeah, the very volatile uh, situation that we're in. Um, despite that, we're still going to continue on and uh, go to Diedrich. Diedrich, uh, we're very curious to hear about the preventive measures and expectations that KLM has for its passengers and staff as the blue skies are opening up uh, during this pandemic. Diedrich, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, uh, this conversation today on behalf of KLM. Uh, it's, it's very uh, good, of course, to see that, uh, that many of the, of the attendants are uh, already planning to, uh, to travel again in the coming, uh, coming months. Um, that is positive, but I can also understand that there are still many questions about the flight part of that, uh, of that travel. So I hope I will be able to answer uh, your questions today. Uh, I will speak about a couple of things. First of all, I'll talk about the, uh, the measures that we've taken, uh, like you already mentioned, Stuart. But I will also give you the latest updates on, uh, on the schedule, because we haven't been flying our regular schedules. Um, and I will also briefly touch upon the topic of uh, our refund and rebooking policy. Um, but before I do so, I would like to make one important remark. And that is that um, all the airlines that are facing uh, this crisis today are trying to deal with it in the best way possible. Uh, but everybody, every airline is facing 
a quite unique set of circumstances. Um, so what you will see is that the measures uh, can differ a little bit. So my advice would definitely be to, uh, to check uh, the website uh, and other information sources of the airline that you are actually booking with. Because today I'm only talking about KLM and a little bit about Air France. Um, and on top of that, um, I think it's also important, even for the KLM information that I give you, things are developing so quickly uh, that it is always important to, to check the website and the important sources of information for the latest information. And I will point you in the right direction at the end of my uh, presentation. Okay. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the measures we've been taking. Uh, first of all, the, the, the measures on the ground, which, which means the airport in our case. Um, what we do uh, every day, uh, multiple times per day, is to deep clean uh, all the, uh, the contact uh, areas where uh, our passengers could be in, in contact. Um, on top of that, we uh, enforce uh, and we promote social distancing at the airport. And so we have signage, but we also have put up uh, uh, plexiglass screens at our counters um, where possible uh, and also for example in the boarding process we have developed a new process where we board our passengers staggeredly uh, meaning we start with the passengers in the back so that we avoid passengers from uh, passing each other. Um, on KLM uh, there's also uh, a mandatory health form that needs to be filled out like uh, Ruth already mentioned uh, that will be handed to you uh, by us uh, at the boarding gate or at the check-in. Um, we also distribute sanitizer, hand sanitizer at the various points at the airport um, and very important I think is that we try to offer uh, a, a bit of peace of mind to all of our travelers in these times by offering uh, flexibility to rebook uh, and that means for example that if you plan to travel at a certain date but just before your travel you or uh, somebody in your party uh, is not feeling too well we allow all of our passengers to rebook uh, without any additional charge. Now on board, of course, our planes, that's where uh, people spend most of their time. What we do is uh, before and after every flight, we dis disinfect the entire interior of our planes. Both our crew and all of our passengers are required to, to wear face masks during the entire duration of the flight. Um, we try to enforce social distancing. Uh, but we only do that where possible, meaning we do not, do not uh, uh, put a cap on the seats that we sell. Um, but when the load factors on our flights allow it, uh, we try to keep the seat next to our travelers open. And if we look at the past uh, months, what we see is that that from the US that has been pretty much on every flight has been possible. We also try to minimize uh, the contact points uh, during the flight uh, and that means for example that we have a uh, limited catering protocol um, and we also do not distribute magazines on board of our flights and we've also temporarily suspended our duty-free product services. Um, and then most importantly, the point I wanted to measure, mention, and it's not necessarily a measure that we've implemented because of the crisis, because this was already in place before that, is that we uh, we have uh, something called HEPA filters uh, on board of our planes and actually many airlines have that um, and what these HEPA filters do is that they filter out even the tiniest particles including uh, viruses like corona and it means that the air on board your plane all the air is filtered uh, every three minutes and these filters are also used, for example, in medical operating rooms and other places where um, that need to be sterile. So it actually makes the air quality on board of the plane relatively clean. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, I would like to mention a little bit about the network that we currently operate. So KLM uh, has chosen uh, not to stop, not to suspend uh, operations completely during the crisis. We've continuously between the US and Europe uh, have operated flights over the past uh, months, but at a reduced uh, capacity, roughly about 20%. Um, 
Um, what we currently see is that, and, and the, the poll has also shown that, is that demand for travel is starting to come back. And so we are also slowly but steadily rebuilding our, uh, our network globally and also in the US. Um, now, the schedule that you see on this slide uh, is actually the, the USA uh, schedule of KLM to Amsterdam. Um, and it's for the period of July. We usually look two months ahead. Um, so this is the July schedule. And the good news uh, for uh, those of you who are in Texas is that uh, we will restart our Houston to Amsterdam flight as of the 4th of July. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but... Um, but it's good news um, and even better news is, and I haven't been able to update that yet in the schedule because the news is really, really fresh. But in August, we will increase that to six flights per week. Uh, so practically every day of the week, there will be a flight from Houston to Amsterdam. Uh, the details of the schedule uh, are, are in this slide. And uh, next to Houston, we will also restart our Boston operations, uh, our San Francisco operations and our uh, Washington operations, and we are also increasing frequencies on LA and on JFK uh, every week. So it's really starting to ramp back up, which is uh, which is really good news. I would like to mention, though, that uh, first of all, these schedules can always change uh, last minute for uh, operational reasons, for example. Uh, so please do always check for the latest uh, flight information and. Uh, Important to mention, of course, is that yeah, the travel restrictions are still in place. So uh, travel is still very much uh, conditional. Uh, so please take that into account. Um, another remark I would like to make uh, is uh, regarding our refund policy, because of course, when travel restrictions like these are in place, and when you only operate 20% of your schedule, uh, many, of our travelers uh, have had to change their plans. So we've been adapting our uh, refund and rebooking policies along the way. Uh, unfortunately, these policies are a little bit complex depending on when you booked and when you are planning to travel. So I, I won't go into full detail uh, today, uh, but all the information is on the website. Um, and in high level, uh, I'd like to uh, explain what the policy entails. So if you have booked a flight and the airline, in, in, in our case, Air France or KLM, uh, has canceled your flight, you can either rebook your flight or you can request a voucher that is valid until the end of 2021. Or there's the option to request a refund. If the airline did not cancel your flight, but you choose as a passenger to, to change, then you still have the options to rebook or to request the voucher, but there is no refund option. So that's basically the, the, the high level uh, structure of our refund policy. Um, that of course only applies to tickets that are non-refundable uh, and, and restricted. If you have a fully refundable ticket, of course your ticket will also be uh, refundable even if the airline doesn't cancel it. Okay. Um, that brings me to the final slide, um, and that is with uh, uh, the website that we have put in place uh, where you can find all the latest information. Uh, the website is called updates.kdm.com. This uh, information is updated every day, uh, so you should be able to find all the information that you're looking for on that website. Um, if for some reason you're not able to find it there, you can still reach out to our uh, customer contact center and the number is in this slide. Um, they are open seven days a week. Um, another good opportunity is to reach out to our social media teams. Uh, that can, you can do that through WhatsApp or Facebook or Messenger or Twitter. And all the details are also to be found on our website. So um, with that, I am through my entire story. Uh, I just hope that things will normalize sooner rather than later and i hope that we can welcome you back on board of our flights uh, really soon thank you and i'll hand it back to you short Diederik, uh, thank you uh, thank you for sharing what klm is doing to keep everybody safe uh, 
during the time on board and uh, what we can expect during our travel. With that, uh, we've gathered quite a number of uh, questions. Uh, Maria, Kuhn, Saskia will lead us through the question and answer session. Okay, well, thank you, Short, and thank you, uh, panelists, for this interesting um, discussion. We have a lot of questions, so I'm not afraid we can answer them all. Uh, but I'm going to try to answer as much, or you're going to try to answer as much questions, and I will hand out some questions for you. The first one I'm having, uh, I saw that question a couple of times, and I want to address it to Ruth. Um, there's a, somebody who has to visit a relative in the Netherlands uh, because of a medical condition. Uh, and the question is, do, does the person have to go in quarantine for 14 days uh, before she actually can visit the, this very sick relative? And for your answer, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Well, thank you, Saskia, for the, for the question. And I can very well imagine that uh, there are people in this situation who would like to know. Um, the answer is, is quite simple in a way. Yes, everybody traveling from a high risk area, which includes the United States, is advised to self-quarantine. Um, and that is also for the safety of those family members. Um, so the, the simple answer is yes, of course it is up to everybody to do that self-quarantine. It's that's not going to be someone at your door checking every day whether you are actually uh, doing the self-quarantine. But it is one of the important uh, measures taken to, to protect the health and safety of the people um, in the Netherlands, so I would say yes, it is it is mandatory. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, good to say that it's good to give short answers because we have a lot of questions. So, thanks for the good the short answer, Maka. This one is for you. Uh, it's from uh, uh, there are different kind of questions, so I'm trying to uh, combine them. Uh, somebody's asking: We are here in the United States on an L1 and L2 visa. Will we be able to return to the U.S. after we visited the Netherlands? Not unless the proclamation restricting travel from the Schengen countries is lifted. When the president originally announced the proclamation on March 11th, at the press conference he said that it would be valid for 60 days, but the proclamation itself is unlimited. Every 15 days, the Secretary of Health and Human Services recommends the president to extend it, and so far it's been extended indefinitely. So you have to wait until the Schengen country's proclamation is terminated to be able to return to the United States, no matter what visa you're on, unless you're a citizen, immediate family member, or permanent resident of the United States. Okay. Well, thank you, Maka. I think this also uh, answers some other questions about visa uh, as well. They have the same question, but a different kind of visa. So I think that will answer the same. Uh, yes. Diederik, I also have a question uh, for you. Um, the Alston Hub. Uh, it was supposed to open uh, last March. Uh, do you know anything about it, if it's going to open and when? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so we have decided already uh, two months ago that we won't open Austin this summer. Um, we also won't open it next winter because it's really a summer destination for us. So we will review by the end of 2020 uh, what the summer schedule for 2021 will look like. Um, so I definitely hope that we will open Austin uh, somewhere in the in spring, um, but it's definitely not a given yet. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going through some other questions. Uh, let me see. Um, I want to, because we have a lot of them, so I have to make sure. Okay, there's a, a US high school graduate, and I think it has to be Rudd, but I'm not sure, or Maka. Uh, there's a high school uh, graduate in Texas. She's accepted to the University of, uh, in Amsterdam and she will start in August. Will she be able in, to travel to the Netherlands and will she be allowed to, to move to the Netherlands? For travel to the Netherlands, there is still the, uh, the entry ban. So the travel ban is valid. So it depends, assuming that this is a a US or at least not somebody who falls under the exception category, so no Dutch uh, citizens tra traveling back. 
So yes, uh, until the travel ban uh, actually has been uh, lifted, um, it will unfortunately not be, be, be possible to travel to the Netherlands. I understand that these are not really the questions we all want to hear, but I think it's very, very good that we have some answers because there are a lot of uncertainty of what's happening. Uh, another question about uh, traveling to the Netherlands, and maybe it's already the same answer, but I have a green card, but uh, was and am on an assignment in the Netherlands for several months for my U.S. employer. Am I able to visit the U.S. for a business trip and return to the Netherlands without quarantine? I think... Ruth, it's you again. Sorry, Saskia, could you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, I have a green card. So, so it's, uh, it's André, he's, from, he's Dutch, but he has a green card. And he is on an assignment in the Netherlands for his U.S. employer. The question is, is he able to visit the U.S. for a business trip and return to the Netherlands without quarantine? To return to the Netherlands without a quarantine? Basically, no, because the advice, but again, it's a strong advice. It's not mandatory but it's a very strong advice is for everybody returning from high-risk areas to self-quarantine uh, the legal status and whether or not it is possible to enter the US I'd like Maka to answer just for um, uh, that 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 would be better if, if she can I just want to with one sentence get back to your previous question in many of these cases it depends whether someone already has a visa yes or no so it's difficult to give a very brief answer and be correct in every case. So if there are people with specific questions about their situation, again, I'd like to stress that it's better to contact the consulate afterwards. Maka, maybe you could answer the uh, green card and possibility to re-enter the US. Yes, happy to do that. Permanent residents, people who have a green card can enter the US. They live here permanently, so they cannot be prevented from coming back. And the people who are subject to the Schengen visa ban are people on temporary visas, H-1B, L-1, ESTA, B-1B-2, student visa, any visas that are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Um, what we have seen happen is because the ban is on physical presence in one of the Schengen countries and not on citizenship per se, um, people who have been able to spend 14 days in a third country, a country that does not have restrictions uh, in terms of entry to the U.S., are able to enter. So, for example, if a Dutch uh, resident can go to an Eastern European country that is not part of the Schengen visa block, uh, spend two full weeks there, so be clear of any kind of you know, threat in terms of infection, then the United States will admit them uh, because they're physically coming from a country that is not included in the Schengen area. Okay, thank you so much. Um, again, we have too much que questions to answer them all. Um, I have a question for Diederik. Um, it's about Schiphol. I don't know if you can answer it, but maybe you can. Uh, when you enter uh, Schiphol, there's um, a lot of crowded lines with immigration. Uh, what about social distancing over there? Can you tell something about it? Yeah, no, that, that, that is a very good question because um, that's actually an airport responsibility. Um, and, um, and every airport uh, has their own approach to uh, how to deal with these kind of situations. And at this moment, I don't know exactly what the approach is from Schiphol. Um, so I, I, I'm not able to answer that question, but what I will do is I'll, I'll try to find out what the latest is and what the plans are so that I can answer this, questions, uh, this question after this conversation. Okay, well, thank you. Um, again, I think we have to, because of the time, we have our final question. The questions who hasn't been answered will be answered via email. Uh, there were some anonymous questions, so if you want to you have your question answered, please answer it, uh, ask the question with your name so we can answer you directly. Uh, I think one final question, and then I give the back floor back to Short. Um, see which one I will ask because, um, yeah, there was a question also about uh, the consulates um, to reopen, and I have to see if I can find it that quick. Sorry for the delay. Oh yeah, if consulates at other states open before Miami, is it possible for someone from Texas to go to consulates? elsewhere 
Yes, of course. I mean, it's not mandatory for anyone to go to a particular consulate. Normally, it's the consulate that's most convenient because it's closest to where people live. However, if in the future, uh, so far it's not the case, all the consulates have a similar uh, level of consular services. But of course, it's uh, possible that in the future, if the situation, the COVID developments change are, are very different in, in one area of the country compared to the other, it's possible that some consulates open, uh, extend, expand their services earlier than others. And then yes, it's possible to go there. Okay, well, thank you for the answer. Uh, sure, can I give the floor back to you? Because we're closing the question, the Q&A right now. And again, the questions that hasn't been answered will be answered via email. Hey, thank you, uh, Saskia. Uh, everybody, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, as Saskia indicated, please uh, keep sending questions. Uh, questions that have been sent uh, will be answered. Uh, we've recorded this webinar, so it can be rewatched, um, and it can be shared uh, with people that uh, that you know uh, might have an interest. Uh, as a closing statement, uh, the NIF exists uh, from memberships and donations. Uh, please do consider supporting the NIF by becoming an individual member or a corporate member, uh, and. Uh, Look forward to our next webinar in two months and the social uh, that we organize also every other month, uh, either virtual or in person, depending on uh, what the, the rules are uh, by the end of July. Thank you very much. And this closes the webinar.